Jacob Wayne show. I am Jacob Wayne, and with me, as always, is Kellen, the Love Devil Gibbons. How you doing? The Love Devil. I'm doing well. I had a just got done playing for the people, celebrating their Valentine's Day that won't celebrate it on the Sabbath. All the Mormons mm. out partying, you know. So that's pretty. I fun. forget that's a thing. Yeah, that's a big thing. Shouldn't uh, Sunday be kind of a day of rest, a great day to just have a nice picnic with your lava? I think they can do that. They can probably go have a picnic. I just guess they like everybody wants to go out to a restaurant so they don't have to make anything. They want all the filthy stuff the day before. Yeah. They don't want God paying too much attention on the ne- on the official day. <laughs> exactly. That's when he's looking their way. He goes with mm-hmm. the time zone. Well, everything's quieted down. Let's see what Tiffany and Truxton are... Oh, my gosh! <laughs> on the Sunday. I, I told them not to do it there. Yeah. In there, on that. You're not supposed to put that in there. Especially today. Damn it. I don't even care if you're not <laughs> moving when you do it. Uh, yep. Well, soaking is still wrong, BYU. <laughs> soaking is still sinning. Yep, I I have the shirt. <laughs> I have it tattooed on my ass. Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, yeah. Are you ready to crack open a beer? I am indeed. All right. Three, two, one. Take that's, a sip, see? That's always the loudest noise of the episode. Mm-hmm. Hopefully it's waking everybody up. Ah. Don't worry, I use I use fancy sound things to make it nice and easy on the ears. Oh, boo. No one Sorry, to people. Okay, I'll cut that part out. <laughs> I am drinking a... Jesus, where's the title? German chocolate cake stout plus oh. milk stout. Mm. It's one pint it's from Wild Works Brewing here in Colorado. Yeah. It's brewed with pecans, coconut, dark chocolate, milk sugar, and vanilla. So you can only have these once in a while or else you're going to be a really rotund round boy or lady. Yeah, but it sounds delicious, though. Oh, it's incredible. And it's 7.4%, so it'll, it'll, it'll get you there. Oh, yeah. But you can't taste it. No, not under all that deliciousness. Sounds very lovely. I like mm-hmm. I like those big stouts, especially the ones that are made to taste like cakes and pastries. Yeah, I think it uh, it's fitting for Valentine's Day weekend as well. Indeed. But uh, what are you sipping on? I'm uh sipping on a Northern from TF Brewing. I think I had one of their beers in the last couple of weeks. Their Belgian beer. So this is a red pale ale. Just a a red IPA, 7.5%. Comes in a nice pint can. And this brewery is seriously just knocking it out of the park. Every single beer I've had from them is like one of my favorites of that's every style. <laughs> they just, everyone they do is good. Hell yeah. So. Well, uh, cheers, mate. Indeed, sir. Uh, and uh, Happy New Year! Yay. Now, now, some of you might be confused. This is February, right? Of course, I'm talking about Chinese New Year's. It is the year of the ox. Woo. And 
That is for anybody that's born today or 12 years ago or 24 years ago, so on and so forth. Um, I don't know if I've talked about it much on this uh, podcast yet, but I'm actually an Asian studies major. Hey. Have I ever talked about that on here? I don't think so. I don't think we've ever talked about either of our degrees now that you mention it, so. Kind of hits the ear funny now to say that I'm an Asian studies major. It just doesn't. I kind of it's weird with just the way culture's been the last five to ten years. Oh yeah, there's part of me that's just like I'm an Asian studies major, and then people kind of give you a look, and you're like, No, nah, yeah, really. Did you <laughs> like, help? Did you help them send over the kami flu from the Wuhan? Oh, I'm thinking more like the people that are just like uh, point of privilege. Um, yeah. <laughs> you are bald and extremely white. How dare you study? You appropriated Asian the culture. Whole country. Yeah, yeah, but uh, all it was is when I was in college, I kind of didn't know what I wanted to do. So one semester, I just picked a bunch of classes that sounded interesting to me, and one of them was Chinese history. It's a history that I had no knowledge of. I think, unfortunately, a lot of Americans have no knowledge of it. Nope. And uh, it just intrigued me. And so when I took that course, unfortunately, I can't really remember the professor's name, even though I really liked him. Um, when he would teach, he was just so kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, enthralling, that you just get really sucked in. But then every once in a while, he'd be like, Hong Zhou or Wu Xing. And you feel like he's kind of doing a, a voice like and you're like is that a, you know once again i'm kind of being a sjw up at college kind of like is he doing a voice like it's yeah. weird <laughs> that he's doing that and then as you learn more about the language you realize that it's tonal um they have in mandarin anyways they have four major tones and like a fifth neutral one so you could say the word ma but five different ways you go ma 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 and they're all different words uh, yeah that's crazy so i think that's where the traditional joke in a lot of american cinema where you know somebody says uh an american says something in chinese and it just becomes a nonsensical sentence uh -huh. is because their tones are all off because you're uh -huh. just like what it means this year what a you know, and no thought of tone whatsoever. So then it just totally flips the words around. But uh, <laughs> anyways, I can wander off and on the subject easily. So I'm going to try to get back to the point. Um, I So I decided I wanted to learn the language. Fell in love with the language, even though it's super difficult and I'm nowhere near fluent. Um, spent some time in Taiwan basically a summer, then came back, finished college, and then went and taught for a year in Hangzhou, mainland China. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it's always been kind of a major component of my life. That's why I like to celebrate Chinese New Year's. And um, I definitely hope to spend more time over there in the future when it's more economically feasible for myself to do so. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so I'm always struggling now that it's been almost seven years since I lived there to like keep the culture and the language in my life and because some of the language is going away from me and everything. So I thought the Jacob Wayne show, why not work it into the episodes a little bit when it's pertinent? So I figured I'd just go mm -hmm. ahead and talk a little bit about what the year of the ox is and a little bit of Chinese zodiac. Um, the ox is the second of the 12 year periodic sequence cycle of animals, which appear in the Chinese zodiac related to the Chinese calendar. Um, Chinese term translated here as ox is in the Chinese new, a word generally referring to cows, bulls, or neutered types of the bovine family. So, the meaning of the zodiacal, in the case of the zodiacal ox, derives from ancient Greek. There are similarities and differences with the concept of zodiac in Western astrology, of course. 
But um, the mythology of the ox, that's what I want to get into. And of course, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, the ox of the Chinese zodiac has a long history. In Chinese mythology, many myths about oxen or ox-like entities include celestial and earthly beings. The myths range from ones which include oxen or composite beings with ox characteristics as major actors to ones with focus on human or divine actors in which the role of the oxen are more subsidiary. In some cases, Chinese myths focus on oxen-related subjects such as plowing, agriculture, or ox-powered carriage. Another important role for beef cattle is in the religious capacity of sacrificial offerings. So Chinese mythology intersects with the idea of the zodiacal ox. And there's one huh. myth about it. Is uh, According to some old mythological traditions, there was a race held by a great deity to determine which creatures in which order would be the namesakes of the 12-year cycle of the Chinese zodiac. The race was run and swum, the finishing line being across a great river. The rat and the ox crossed easily enough, the ox due to being large, powerful, and adept both on land and in water. The rat asked the good-natured ox for a ride on its back, but then ungratefully jumped off at the last minute to cross the finish line first. Oh. Like the dirty rat it is. <laughs> Shit. So, there's a little bit of information on it. Um, I didn't actually bother to find what the characteristics of people born in the year of the ox are, but honestly, I don't believe in any of that stuff. I just find the information and mythology interesting. Yeah. But, uh, it don't, so, it don't sound good. Lots of sacrificing yeah. and giving rats rides. Mm -hmm. So 2020 was the year of the rat. Was that basically, uh, Yeah. Oh, well, it was that the makes year sense. of the rat. Kind of makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but yes, that was the other thing is the Chinese year, at least within this mythology in particular calendar, is 4,707. And it's the year of the ox as of January 26th. Or I'm sorry. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Totally got that wrong. I'm looking at the last year of the ox. It is 4719. And then, yeah, oh, it's uh, uh, February 12th, 2021. Yeah. There we go. So, yeah, the last year, 4718, was the year of the rat. And that started on January 25th, 2020. I think that's why a lot of people can sometimes get confused about when Chinese New Year starts. Because sometimes it's January, sometimes February. Oh, it moves around, I see. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's, you know, it's based on a, a lunar calendar and there's many uh, lunar calendars throughout human history. And it wasn't really until the Gregorian calendar and a little bit of help from uh, Julius Caesar that we get the calendar that we have now and doesn't have anything to do with the moon. And yeah. kind of fucked everything up. It's kind of dumb. I was just thinking that, like, this is a much better time for a new year. Like, yeah. The end of December sucks. Like, there's still just, like, weeks of bleakness. doesn't feel yeah. like anything is renewed. So, we're yeah, we've said much that, closer like, to that. <laughs> January is, like, um, the, it's the Monday of months. Yep. Indeed. And uh, apparently, and I was doing a little bit of research on this today, apparently there's one point in Chinese history where they would even have like a 13th month. And I think that oh. that was sort of like the leap year sort of compensation, but just through their particular system. Um, so huh. that actually had me thinking about one thing also before we hop into the next thing, which Julius Caesar kind of reminded me of. Um, I was listening to Neil deGrasse Tyson's podcast today while I was doing a little bit of work. And he brought something up like he usually does, which is kind of like, do you want this just random astrological factoid out of nowhere? And I'm like, yeah, actually I do. Yeah. And then he was saying, if life had been able to develop on Venus, 
the culture would have no culture based on stars or astrology because of the cloud coverage. It's like always covered by clouds. So if you were on the surface of Venus, you'd never see stars. Huh. Yeah, which got me to thinking about how important stars and the moon and the sun are to just our knowledge of math and art and everything. Like we write songs about the moon and attach it to our emotions and follow it to know when to plant our food and yeah. Yeah. So it was kind of an interesting thought. Indeed. Yeah. It's a big part, you know, astrology, uh, not, not astrology. The astronomy. Astronomy is like the, like kind of one of the first sciences kind of basis of all human knowing, I think kind of, mm-hmm. kind of led to everything. People starting to figure that out. I mean, how old is the sundial? Damn. I don't know. I haven't celebrated its birthday in years. Yeah. But I guess that does actually kind of segue a little bit back to Julius Caesar. Is, uh kind of shows that when you, you don't follow the natural truths of the universe and you bend towards simplistic, humanistic power... Yeah. Then people will name everything after themselves, Trump, <laughs> and basically start changing things and ha- that has nothing to do with the order of the natural world. So yeah. that segues us right into the piece of shit getting acquitted again. Yeah. I don't think it's surprising. I think everybody anticipated it, but still really hurts and it would put me in a sour mood today yep. for sure it's disappointing big time yeah and it's just like thank you very much this is just the beginning you know it's just yeah i wonder what other terrible guy in history had a timeline kind of just like this uh there's been a few i believe yeah there's another one though he had great sense of hairstyle you know did weird he, his was more of a mustache thing but yeah he had that fun little thing yeah but uh oh his his dick broom <laughs> <laughs> somebody i guess it's more like a, a a dick duster not really a full broom <laughs> that sounds like one of those old christian quartets they could get a vinyl of yeah <laughs> dick duster in the sons of lamanite I heard about that on your mom's house. I got to give credit where credit's due, but I had never heard a mustache called a dick broom before. <laughs> That's good. I was like, oh, well, there you go. Uh, especially in these cases. So it just, it, and I feel like I've seen this image already before, but like, like Hitler in a maid outfit. Now it just gives a whole new meaning to that little mustache when he has a little maid outfit on. (laughs) Just dusting and cleaning your house. Filling it full of terrible ideas. Yep. But, uh... I don't know. There's there's not much else to say about that. Hope he gets tried on all the other crimes. There's, There's a few other possible criminal cases against him. Like, he can't run for president if he's in jail, so... True. That'd be cool. Well, and I also don't want to be hyperbolic, so I'm trying to think of how to phrase it, but I do feel that when some of these senators are jurors in your impeachment case, but they're also working with your legal team, to me that makes them co-conspirators. Yeah. And also, I think 15... Uh, GOP senators didn't even show up, which I, as for you and I, if we don't show up to court when we're supposed to be there, we go to jail. Yeah. So I'm not saying fuck you to my Republican friends, but I am saying fuck the Republican Party. It's dead to me. I don't want to work with it because they're just nothing but criminals and liars to me now. Yep. That being said, I think something needs to be done. There needs to be 
if there's some way to purge the party of this just basically lying and lawbreaking. And believe me, if there's a liar and lawbreaker in the Democratic Party, they should be removed too. Yeah. Um, if that can happen, then maybe over time the Republican Party can redeem itself, but I just don't see how they're going to do that. I think they need to form a new conservative party in this country. And I know that some people would be like, oh, see, of course you would say that. Because then it would split the vote between Republicans and the conservatives and the Democrats would always win. But as far as my thinking goes, what's tragic about all this is that when you don't have a conservative party that's counteracting the liberal party in your country then it becomes that lesser of two evils thing that people talk about. It's, well, I'm always going to vote for the Democrats because there's no fucking way I'm going to vote for a Republican. So then they get to yeah. get away with stuff. But if you just simply had a conservative party that told the truth and adapted with the times, so maybe wasn't so homophobic or gave a shit about pot, maybe didn't court religion so hard, you could yeah. have that, that balance and they'd come right back. I think people would be surprised how quickly a revamped conservative party could really be a good thing and actually balance out some of the newer progressives we have. Then yeah. we could leave the neoconservatives and neoliberals in the dust. And you wouldn't have yeah. to have a Pelosi or a McConnell. You could just have yeah. new, fresh thinking. But... You know, as of today, though, just I have no in interest in even hearing what somebody who still calls themselves a Republican. Like, I don't how they justify want to hear what they think. I don't care because it's not based in reality. Nope. And that makes sense because most of them are like the ones I know are Mormon. So they're they are not based in reality. <laughs> yeah. Well, and. And you know how much, and I think listeners are starting to get this, but you know how much I hate the, well, both sides, just the same, they're the exact same. Of course they're not, but just to make somebody who's a little more conservative feel better if they're listening to this, um, we watched that one video that was like the socialist convention somewhere. And it was just like, point of privilege, could we have to stop using gendered language in this room? And... It was just insanity of, like, people just defining that, yes, the whole room has to revolve around me and my needs. There was one guy interrupting the whole meeting because a couple people were whispering around him. Yeah. We all remember that kid in school. Fuck that kid. <laughs> <laughs> like, so don't get me wrong. There's the, the other side of this that's like that's why you need a healthy conservative party but it's got to stop being this uh well they did this so that means we can do this it's like no nope they did do that but if you do it it's still wrong exactly. it's kind of it's kind of like it reminds me of a thing patrice o'neill said once is he was calling out somebody for being a fat motherfucker and then they're like what the hell? Like well, you're fat, and it's just like, I know, I'm a fat motherfucker too. So I could especially call you out for being fat, you fat piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> it is just like, so yeah, so what? I'm fat, you're fat too, bitch. Like, <laughs> and it's just like, it's kind of such a G whiz thing. But I was like, yeah, so many people do that and just expect the argument to be over. So well, the person you supported did that thing too. So. Uh. And it's like, well, that's what about is, and it doesn't work. Oh yeah, that's and that's the only argument I've heard from all any conservative friend is that what about this stupid thing that's usually not even true. <laughs> yeah. Well, and unfortunately, as far as message boards and comment threads go, a lot of people on the left are adopting that as well, and it's just not a good way to argue your point. So. No. Anyways, it's it's a sad day to me, and hopefully he does get charged, and there's some karma for 
trying to overthrow our country. <laughs> yeah. But, you know. At least every single person that was there, I hope, I know the FBI is trying to round them all up. I, sh- I seriously hope they do or are successful. <laughs> like, geez, some of the footage they showed that I, I hadn't, you know, I didn't really yeah. watch much of it. I couldn't, didn't want it's to. Hard to stomach. Yeah. So I saw some more that I hadn't seen. I was like, okay, they got those guys and going to jail for life, right? Like people yeah. holding a Blue Lives Matter flag, beating a cop in the face. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, which is just yeah, it's crazy. But when you believe in conspiracy, and then you can just attach a label of, oh, they're on the side of truth, they're they're on the other side. It's kind of like that line in the Matrix where they're like, these people haven't woken up to the truth, and so long as they haven't woken up to the truth, they are your enemy, and they're exposable. And that line always bugged me because it's just like I, I know that it's true in the case of the movie, but it's just like how many just douchebag conspiracy theorists heard that line and were like, "Yeah, oh yeah." <laughs> if they don't get where I'm coming from, they're just part of the problem too. They're just caught in the lie. Move along. Yeah. They're another soldier for the man, man. Mad, mad. But. Uh, this works as a good segue to just kind of slowly get out of politics. Um, Dave Chappelle dropped another 10 minute something talk. <laughs> it, yeah. It's like hardly even comedy anymore. He just drops these like 10 to 15 minute things and they're still captivating. Does he get like a room of people together or like what is it? Like- yeah, um, he had a stage near his farm in Ohio. Oh. during the whole summer and lot tons of podcasts have talked about this so i won't waste too much time on it but um it's kind of like a comedian summer camp and he had all these people come and everybody was safely distanced and uh yeah they'd come out but in this one he's in texas um at the barbecue pit or something like that oh, okay and in austin that's where Joe Rogan moved to and Tom Segura's moving to and a lot of other comedians. Because, you know, they have a little less restrictions than California. And they can kind of experiment with how to do stand-up comedy and try to follow, you know, CDC guidelines, wear a mask, kind of be separated six feet. That being said, Dave Chappelle did catch COVID recently. Oh, damn. And part of what he addresses in the little special is people that are like laughing at him for catching it. And he's just kind of calling them out for his like, you're just gonna, you're just a bunch of cowards. Like you're just going to stay in your house and not do anything and just poke holes in people that are trying to like move forward. And I think that is something about all this COVIDness is, uh, there's one side of it. That's so ridiculous with like, I won't wear a mask. If I wear a mask, I can't breathe. This is the man trying to take us over and create a one world government. Like there's all this insane shit on one side. Yeah. That it does make it harder to notice the people that are like getting on like there's there's a Reddit thread here in Fort Collins. And just a whole bunch of people are sitting there bitching at people that weren't wearing their masks when they walked outside on the sidewalk. Huh? And it was just like, shut the fuck up. You like, don't if, need if, to wear it if you're outside and you're with the, oh, six feet away from people. You're fine. What if I come <laughs> around the corner, though, and I'm walking and I don't see you? It's just like, well, <laughs> sorry that life happened. But honestly, if I'm walking around without my mask on, I'm yeah. outside. I can see in all the directions. If somebody's coming towards me, I either pull it up if I can't move out of the way or I move six feet away. And six feet is for indoor, unventilated spaces. You're totally yeah. fine outside. But I mean, and I don't know what it is. This is a whole other thing. But like, I don't know if you've noticed this, but something about COVID has made people like, just as far as directions go, like get really mm-hmm. stupid. Like people will go to the store and just stop and at in front of the door. It's yeah. like you are clogging up this whole system. What the fuck are you doing? Yeah. And, you know, and back in the day, you just shoulder right past them. You might bump shoulders, but, you know, 
now everybody yeah. has to have that little bit of space. But then, yeah, when you try to move over a little bit for somebody to come by you, then somebody will like, let me get in on that. And <laughs> they'll come from another direction, the direction you're moving into to get away from the other person. And then just everybody's like, ah! yeah. <laughs> and just I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you people? Like, and then I realize that I don't drive. Uh huh. And oh, this must be what driving feels like. Oh yeah, dude. I don't know if that is just because it snowed today, but yeah. As soon as you just put rules on it, then people become morons. Dude, the roundabouts here, like we just got roundabouts are just a couple of years old in Logan, and they people can't handle it. They cannot do mm. it. Uh, yeah. Anyway, anyways, so. Uh, Chappelle starts off his little mini special with that and then he got into the the rioters at the Capitol and called them out and so I highly recommend it it's just like he really managed to get my sentiments across and I think he is one of those guys that's has a pretty balanced take on society as it is today so I mean Mm -hmm. we've had the discussion before I think Patrice O'Neill will always be my favorite comedian but Dave Chappelle is probably one of the best, if not the best. I know it's a little subjective, but I mean, I feel like Patrice, some of his best stuff was when he was on a radio show and he's just talking. Yeah. And that's the, I guess that's the other element of Dave Chappelle is it's like the thing that elevates him so much is he's made hilarious, hilarious specials, but he's also just super prolific and churning them out. And some of them are just talks, and it's still interesting. So he's he's on this level of a great American thinker or poet or something even beyond just a stand-up comedian. So yeah, for sure. Anyways, he the main reason he put it out is you might have recalled that he asked people to stop watching the Chappelle Show on Netflix yeah. and HBO Max because he wasn't getting paid. Well. Everybody stopped watching it. And Netflix apparently is ran by a fairly cool dude or some cool people. And they were like, oh, well, let us pay you. And then he got uh, the guy at Warner who owns the contract that he signed for Chappelle's show. Uh huh. And they paid him and I think gave him oh, shit. the license back. So. Yeah, so Hell Chappelle yeah. shows back up on Netflix, and now you don't got to feel guilty about watching it. I'm going to go start watching that. Yeah, man. So it's a a win for Chappelle, a win for creators, I feel. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's just there's another guy who's just doing some great things, and it's good to hear from him, get his opinion on recent events. But I don't even think you mentioned Trump once, which I think is where we all need to get to. I think we need to call out the current state of the Republican Party, and obviously that's going to attach to him a little bit, but yeah, he's just he's he's as good as dead. It's the ideas that we need to defeat, not just one man. By by attached to him a little bit, do you mean like French kissing his asshole? (laughs) Well, yeah, like you know, we're just like, get up behind him and just while you're kind of kneading his love handles, just go, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> just right behind his ear so he can feel, like, the moisture. Yep. You have to take a, take a bat. Like, what do you think gets that, that orange off? I don't know if it ever comes off. Um, burger grease. Oh. Well, that, that's what it's, like, part of what it's made out of. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's actually... Right. That breaks it down. Sick. Uh, what's the? Uh, what is that term? It's like when the bird lives on top of the hippo. Oh Symbiotic yeah. Symbiotic relationship. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Yes. He he greases the grease and the grease greases him. Mm-hmm. It's really tragic in a way. Everything about him is tragic. It's almost like. At this point, if he told the truth, it would be a lie. Oh, yeah. It's like the ultimate cried wolf story. Mm-hmm. 
you could say anything and I'd be like, yeah, shut up. Get out of here, Florida man. Be gone with you, Florida man. <sighs> well, with that, let's, uh, oh, we're chugging along here. So how about we get into a little bit of the music news and discussion? Um, hmm. I feel like I'll just recommend an album real quick. Because I f- imagine we'll get into an important rest in peace. Yeah. So I gotta see if I can find this real quick. But I was okay. Um, just one brand new release. I'm just barely wrapping my head around it. It's by this uh, poet named Losh or Losh. It's spelled L O S H H. And. Uh, it's kind of got like this free jazz and funk and reggae background to it, but he's just doing his poetry over the top of it. That's and, cool. Uh, yeah, it came out on Friday, and it just reminded me of some of my favorite albums that are like that. I don't have a lot, but uh, there's... Uh... Oh, I can't believe I can't think of the title off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll find it here in a minute. But another one is Saul Williams. Um, he's another poet who had like a lot of music background to his stuff. And it was, you know, it's almost like rap, but it just it it was read different. It was a different type of cadence. And uh Yeah. He worked with Trent Reznor on one of his albums and saw him live with Les Claypool in Salt Lake City once and Oh cool. Unfortunately, Salt Lake City was Salt Lake City about it. And they were just not down with the poetry rapness of it all at the time, but hopefully they've gotten better about that. That was back in two thousand five or something. Oh wow. Sounds so, interesting. Yeah, it's good stuff. So just uh the E P is called Ifarera. That's I F A R A D A and that's by Losh. L O S H H. Well. I'll have to check that one out. Yeah. Uh, any new album or anything else come out that you want to shout out? Um, let's see. I, I was reading about uh, Dr. Lonnie Smith has a new album coming out. I don't know if it's came okay. out or if it's coming out in the next couple of days, but that should be good. Apparently he has a uh, some like punk singer guesting on it i'm interested to see what he comes up with should be pretty hmm. pretty interesting i hope it works did you ever listen to that uh metallica with uh <laughs> god damn it, i'm forgetting all the names today metallica with lou reed I, I remember hearing about that i never listened to it dude it's terrible because yeah. it takes out all the elements of Metallica that are fun, like the heaviness and the metal, you know? Yeah. And they're kind of just doing the slowed down, more acoustic almost, like rock thing. And then Lou Reed's just about ready to die. And he's just like, I'm an old man singing sadness over the top of a rock song. Who's the rock now, daddy? <laughs> it just... And then behind it's like, hey, who's the rock now, daddy? Yeah. <laughs> Hat film to that. Yeah, and it's just like, holy shit, like, whose idea was this? It's probably Lars. Yeah, it was Lars. But it's way worse than Lars's snare drum. Like, whoa. I don't even give a shit about that snare drum anymore. God All damn. about Lulu now. That thing is like one of the worst things I've ever heard. Man, but you know, kudos for experimenting, I guess. <laughs> you know, you got at least they tried something new, I guess. Yeah, I guess you gotta you gotta try to give credit for stuff like that. Indeed, the album, the artist I was trying to think of was Michael Smith. It's probably why I couldn't think of it because it's just kind of a generic name. But uh, he was a Jamaican dub poet. And I have his record on vinyl. It's Me Can Believe It. Huh. And it's spelled M I C Y A A N Believe It. 
So it's like written out in patois. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a great album. So I don't have a lot of records like that, but when I find them, they're like they're really unique. So, anyways, nice. So uh, let's get into some rest in peace. Uh, musicians um i did want to get into one before we get into kind of the main one for the both of us i imagine anyways uh did you hear that milford graves passed away um i did i was just reading about that just a little bit earlier tonight but i wasn't even sure if i knew like where i knew that name (laughs) yes i was curious if you did know about him i i had never heard of him but uh there was a post from quest love which I was going to go ahead and read because I feel like it did give a good idea of him. I ended up listening to an album after reading this. Oh, cool. And you can see what he's saying in this post, so I'll just go ahead and read it. Uh, Man, I saw Milford Graves as a teen back in 1990. Kept saying the whole time, I don't know drums could do this. I mean, yeah, Mad Cat's colored outside the lines and boundaries, but I never seen a drummer not be an anchor but executed in such a masterful way. No drumming freely to be a nuisance. It was like watching a spiritual exorcism on stage. At the reception, he just said he drums what his mood dictates. No planning. Once I got into sound bath journeys, I realized that's what I was watching on stage. Such an unsung hero. Rest in peace and beats and spirit. Thank you. So when I threw on his uh, record... He definitely is not an anchor. Like, he's all over the place. Is there other and people? Or is it just a drumming solo? The one I listen to in particular... Um, Let's go back to my played albums. Don't get this name right. Um, He had a saxophone player playing with him. So they're both just doing... You know, I could be getting the terms wrong or whatever, but it sounded like uh, free jazz kind of stuff. Yeah, probably. And this is an album called Real Deal. And David Murray was a saxophone player. I don't know if you heard of him, but it's really abrasive. It's like totally that abrasive jazz style. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I was like, you know, but it, 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 I'll, I'll be honest, it was a little annoying. You could tell they're both talented, but it was like a little like, ah. But what is surprising about that is as I was listening to it, it slowly kind of became the background. And I realized I was just listening to the whole thing while I was doing other stuff. And so that's what was kind of fascinating to me about it is it could be so abrasive and in your face and then at one point it kind of just became the the sound for whatever it was i was doing yeah and very talented players and it it does offer itself up as to be something to you kind of want to figure out okay what is he actually thinking right here like what's what's he doing so yeah a really great drummer that i'm excited to kind of just listen to a little bit more and try to wrap my head around it. Yeah. That yeah. sounds interesting. Yeah. So real deal. Milford Graves, check it out, everybody and rest in peace to him. Yeah. The algorithm actually must've pulled that up. Cause you liked it. Cause that's exactly the post I read. I didn't realize it was quest love, but <laughs> there yeah, you there you go. And with that, let's get into it. Uh, Rest in peace to Chick Corea, jazz keyboardist and innovator. Dies at 79. Um, I'll let you go into that a little bit because I know Chick Corea and some of his work, but you're way more knowledgeable. So let's go ahead well, and let the people know. <laughs> well, uh, I, you know, I still am, have a lot of his work to get through, but yeah, he's just one of the all-time greatest jazz pianists. And and other just keyboardists. He did love the acoustic piano. He always was playing that, but he really liked keyboards too. He was always on the forefront of synthesizers and stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. His best known group was probably uh, Return to Forever. 
which is a jazz fusion group. I got to see them live when they did their return to return to forever tour, whatever they called it. Okay. <laughs> it was awesome. I'm very glad that I got to see them now. Uh, cause that, that's not a, yeah, it's kind of rare to get to see him. He was playing a lot. Just like, you know, he was really well known <laughs> and they were expensive tickets. So I'm really glad. So he was probably going time. everywhere. Yeah. Excuse me. I've got a little bit of hiccups from the German chocolate cake. Ooh. But yeah, he, um, yeah, he just wrote tons of like Spain. That composition is just one of the oh, very well known, uh, 500 Miles High, Tones for Jones Bones, Armando's Rumba. Tons of good ones. Um, the albums I've heard just amazing things about from him just by himself are uh, Now He Sings, Now He Sobs. I've had a lot, heard a lot of people recognize, like, say that's like, that's one of their favorites. So mm. um, there's another one, like a trio he did that's really good, like, uh, trilogy i think it's that one yeah um yeah and then of course the return to forever stuff's awesome Mm -hmm. uh we listened to my favorite album from them where have i known you before which i believe might be like their first one like the first album they ever did but it is it's just so good looks like it um yeah we we listened to that we kind of like to throw on an album and play civ like kind of a low energy video game and kind of just be playing that and throw on an album we both, like one of us knows, or just kind of delve into old stuff. We usually do a lot of Frank Zappa and things like that. But we listened to Where Have I Known You Before, and that's just a great record. I'm going to definitely look for it on vinyl. Uh, The song, Song to the Pharaoh Kings, was incredible and probably would be my recommended track off of that. Yeah, it's a... Beyond the Seventh Galaxy was another one that really stood out to me. Yeah, that's a sweet one. You know, the Song of the Pharaoh King is like, what, 13 minutes long, and it's just this epic, and it's... 14 minutes and 23 seconds. Yeah, and it never stops being awesome. I just love the whole thing, and that yeah. that is a great one if you've never heard Chikoria, because it opens up with just this, like, keyboard, like, this insanity... It's just him alone, just shredding on keyboards for a while, and then it kicks into this awesome groove. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um. So I was trying to figure this out the other night. I was wondering if Jocko played on "Where Have I Known You Before." Jocko played with "Return to Forever" at one point, didn't he? Or am I mistaken? Um, I don't know for sure. I don't believe so. I feel like Stanley was a pretty root member i know he did have some other uh like lineups occasionally so he might have like subbed or something was I'm there another um kind of fusiony jazz group that was out around return to forever yeah yeah that's a uh, weather report is what jocko was in that's probably what i was thinking yeah doing because i just remembered he was in it and then they had a bit of a falling out but yeah, uh, yeah, I guess no, it's important to make that distinction. So Stanley Clark was on at least that album we're talking about. Yeah, uh, where have I known you before? And he kills it. Um, you know, a lot of bass players these days they throw around, oh, Les Claypool or Robert Trujillo or Flea, and amazing bass players, of course. But if you talked, if you, I bet you anything, if you went up to Les Claypool and said, you're the best p- bass player that ever lived, he'd be like, you son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Go listen to Every, some tunes. <laughs> and you, you never heard of uh, Marcus Miller? Uh, Stanley Clark? Getty Lee, you son of a bitch? <laughs> like, yeah. those are the basis. So, if you don't know Jocko and you don't know Stanley Car- Clark, uh, go check it out. Yeah, this whole, that whole album, there's a few bass solos, but. Like, man, he is just grooving so hard when somebody else is soloing. Just his bass lines are so just stanky. What was the one where it is almost like him and the drummer? Was that Beyond the Seventh Galaxy? Yeah, I think he has a big solo in that one. But it's like the way it's the bass is just stomping with the drum pattern. Just great. Yeah. And it really is just more of like that kind of a groove. 
Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Just go check out the album. I highly recommend it. And rest in peace to Chick Corea. It's a great player. Indeed. That's a. That's a. That's a big one. He was like a living legend. So. That sucks. But yeah, rest in peace. He did live to a good age, though. Yeah, he made a good long time. You know, we all kind of. Huh? I don't think anybody wants to be a hundred. Uh, you know, some people do, of course, but like, you know, yeah. it's like 79. You're like, damn, it's still a little too young, but that's eh, a good life. Yeah. Basically, when people pass away in their 90s, you're like, good job. <laughs> like, it's 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 like not nearly as sad. It's more like a yeah, good. You fucking did it. You made it the long haul. Yeah. So. He's just right about there. Wish we could have gotten a few more years, but that being said, he got a yeah, life he, and great career. I think he got a rare form of cancer. I heard, so I'm, I'm just total guess. I wonder if he just didn't want to, you know, try to fight that. If he was just, you know, yeah. let it go. But yeah, I don't know. Um, Neil Peart, <laughs> Neil Peart. Uh, I think he had cancer too, didn't he? Yeah, I think so. I don't know how much he tried to fight it either. Or... Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. As we've discussed, the older we get, the more and more this is going to happen. It's not the universe out to get you. It's just the way the universe is. Indeed. So, that being said, I think we're going to introduce kind of a new Lucy Goosey segment. We don't have a name for it yet or anything, but I thought we'd have like little mini uh psychological discussions oh yeah get all like, not psycho uh, not psychology uh, but more philosophy i got you philosophical okay. get all Sorry. get all deep with it yeah so i figure you'll know what time it is every time i do that with the lighter and then we'll play an <laughs> intro song quite uh I'm I'm gonna work on that. Hopefully, we have it ready for next episode. But yeah, um, do you have a little tidbit for me? I do. Cool. Nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this because I'm in Colorado. <laughs> well, so we found this found a list of several philosophy questions, and uh, I've decided to go with the old random number generator instead of try to pick one and just let it decide and we'll just have to work through these sounds good so it came with a pretty interesting one i feel like for the first one this one's just a pretty big one gonna knock you right at get right to it you ready yep can wars ever be just huh what do you think Hmm. Right uh, off the bat, I uh, I'm, I'm going to start with a little bit of a thing. I'm not dodging the question. I'm just setting things up. Okay. Um, I feel like I can't remember who pointed this out, but it's stuck with me since I heard it. It's okay and completely normal to agree with something in like percentages so when i say like i think this i might be saying it like 80 percent 80 percent of me says yeah that's that that's it yeah and i feel pretty confident about that 80 percent. but that being said there is a little bit of that existential weird 20 hmm, percent that you could convince me so The reason I point that out is I think you can feel pretty certain about something, but still leave room open to be convinced or at least adjust what you think. That being said, I think it's better to think of it that way than, well, you know, there's no such thing as truth. It's just perception. And, you know, if I'm looking at a six from one angle, it might look like a nine to you. So blah, 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 blah. Well, whoever wrote that number down, either wrote it down as a six or wrote it down as as a nine. And maybe they didn't communicate it properly because they could have put a line underneath one end. But yeah. it is definitely only one number. Yeah. 
it's not whatever you want, man. So I'm definitely not that type of person. But that being said, I think there are just wars. And I think it's as simple as a war of defense. If your yeah. nation's being invaded, you must go to war and defend your land or your family. And war is a natural part of existence. Um, people like to say that it's like a man-made concept, but well, that's... if you go and if you go into nature, um, there's all kinds of warfare. It's just different because it's not psycho. Humans. It doesn't have the psychological yeah. element. It's more likely, usually, just dominations of certain species and stuff, and. Mm -hmm. Human made constructs are a human made construct. That sentence doesn't sure. really even mean anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I posted that one video. I don't know if you saw it. Um, it was the termites and the ants. Yeah. Um, they're both kind of going different directions, and the soldiers from both hives, or I don't even know if you call it a hive of termites or not, but um, the soldiers from both the termites and the ants made a line just defending their side. And it was completely peaceful. They were just trying to make sure no shit went down. And I was like, I was kind of like, an, that was, that's war in a way. Yeah. It's uh we're definitely aware that our workers will start fighting. So we're going to pr protect this line and, you know, you, you get into chimpanzees and the way that they are about their territory and what they'll do to other troops of chimpanzees. I mean, they're even called troops. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. They'll even, like, attack in the night and stuff in groups. Like, yeah, there is straight-up warfare in nature for sure. And, yeah, and I think that does get into a little bit of, like, almost the the vegan vegetarian meat-eating discussion a little bit it's only in the sense that i think somebody who says war is never justified is somebody who's trying to lead a purely peaceful pacifist lifestyle and while it's noble for me i don't find it to be very realistic so i respect mm -hmm. it but uh the universe eats and eats itself through one form over the other and i feel like uh humanity needs to come to better terms with death and what death is like it's it's scary but it doesn't need to be terrifying it's a part of the whole thing you know mm -hmm. and yeah that being said there's horrible atrocities committed in warfare and I think we've seen that throughout history. Um, you know, there was something noble about going out with the sword and facing your enemy face to face. And over time, it became guns and then bombs and then drones and became more impartial and just dropping chemicals on innocence just so the warriors will stop fighting. And that's dishonorable and sick and i think that that is a particularly human thing yeah but uh yeah i think as far as hey these people for whatever reason they're broken people or they're aggressive or they're angry or whatever it is they're attacking me or my friends and family or my land i think it's completely justified to go to war with them indeed I agree with that. And yeah, I'd I'd like to like hope that someday humanity will reach the point where it's no longer necessary, but we're not there yet. Well, we could sure. be. We should be, but we ain't. Do you remember did you, you ever watch that movie The Last Samurai? I don't think I've actually I don't think I've actually seen that one or if I have, it's been a very long time. I think it gets a little bit of a bad rap because, you know, it's Tom Cruise and it says The Last Samurai on the poster. Oh, yeah, people are very And so upset. people are like, oh, God, he's The Last Samurai. And it's like, no, it's 
Ken Watanabe's character, who's the last samurai. And uh, he gets to be in his presence for the, the last days of the samurai in Japan as the West is selling them cannons and... Not even cannons, uh, artillery. Like uh, rapid-fire artillery. Oh, yeah. And there's a scene where the uh, the samurai are coming up the field and have gotten a long way further than anybody anticipated and everybody's like really terrified on the line but then they finally get the artillery to start firing and it just mows them all down immediately. Mm-hmm. And then everybody on the modern militarized side of the Japanese like sinks to their knees crying because they just decimated these honorable warriors that were like such a huge part of their culture and their past. Oh, wow. And there's the part where, you know, Tom Cruise's character gets all shot up and Ken Watanabe's character gets shot up and they're like crawling towards each other. And Ken Watanabe wants uh, Tom Cruise to stab him and kill him. Cause he's like, this is the spot. This is a perfect death. And yeah, he stabs him and he's looking over his shoulder and sees all these uh, cherry blossoms floating in the wind. And he's just Uh like, perfect. And he dies. And it's like, that's like a true warrior's death. And I think there's something to that. I, I think, uh, there is a time to be a warrior and to fight for what you believe in. Hopefully it is, Truth and justice and that which is good in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. That's pretty good for the... I think we should maybe call him Think Deeps with Jacob Wayne. Yeah. Think Deeps. Okay. Think Deeps. (laughs) Think Deeps. Oh, and then, yeah, we have this one particular idea, so we need like... Yes. Uh. Quite. Quite. <laughs> quite. <laughs> we need to get a couple of you all. They'll stay quiet. Mm. Yes. Quite. Do tell. <laughs> uh, have a battery. I dare say. Preposterous. <laughs> Rutabaker, Rutabaker, Rutabaker. Baba Bowie. <laughs> okay. You should be able to do something just fantastic sure. for that. Oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. I got it. Hold on, one more. I can't do it like I was as a kid. I was doing the armpit thing. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's hit the last two segments and call it good. All right. I forgot which one we do first again. Uh, Usually the dear Jacob Wayne. That's right. Okay. Let's hit it. All right. So this is a this is a fun one, dear Jacob Wayne. So basically, <laughs> sorry, I mm-hmm. I couldn't help but read it like that. So basically, the other day during my morning shift, I saw my boss drinking a monster, and said something along the lines of "Ha ha, those are so good, but they're so bad for you." He said, "Oh, you like these? What's your favorite flavor?" And I told him. And the other day, he saw me in the back room and said, I got this for you, Mama, and gave me one. That was the first period right there, just so you know. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So before continuing, calling her Mama. Yeah, so it gets weird. It's already weird. This is going to get weirder. (laughs) Yeah, he called her Mama. Okay. I figured Cos, Cosine, C-O-S. Is that why do people think that's how you spell cuz or is that like a for real the shortening? Um, I've never seen it. I usually okay. see C U Z. 
that's even a little more acceptable than this. Maybe it's okay. Mm, I don't know. I figured costs. He got me one. I should get him one too. And today during my shift, gave one to him. And he was surprised, but thanked me a couple times for it. Now I feel kind of weird about it. And I don't know if it matters, but I kind of have a work crush on him. But he's married. <laughs> but besides that, is it weird to give your boss a drink? Help, Jacob Wayne. No, it's not weird at all. It's completely normal to gift exchange with a coworker. And I guess I'm just wondering why, you know, you can't help sexual attraction. It happens when it happens. But it's like, what was the thing that did it for you? Was that he got you a gift or that he called you mama? Yeah. <laughs> like, he, there's not a lot there. Or like somebody <laughs> just did something nice for you and now you're like, Ugh. Yeah. Like, um, I, I've had bosses that I think to varying degrees of them liking me or not that we've had a really good relationship with like, oh, hey, uh, you're usually hungry right around now. I got you some tortillas. Or, oh, hey, I know you like this drink, so I got you a coffee with like a little extra cream. You know, it's just a way of letting your coworker know that you're thinking about them and wish them well and want them to have a good day. And usually it's just good karma that gets reciprocated and works easier to get through. Um. That being said, that reminds me of a time at work where I'll leave the particular job's name out of it. But uh, the boss brought in a bunch of peaches. And she was passing them out to everybody. And it was a job where I was the only male employee. Uh -huh. A lot of times. Sometimes not, but a lot of times I was the only male in there. And just a bunch of ladies sitting around and we were passing around peaches and then I was like really hungry. So I just like, Oh, I just like really bit into one. <laughs> and then just all the women around me started giggling. And we all knew the subtext. <laughs> and I just like, I kind of finished chewing. I was like, I'm like, you're all ridiculous. <laughs> just like, I got up and walked outside to finish my peach. Cause I wasn't going to finish eating it in front of him. Not with that attitude, yeah. Yeah, no, but it was just, that was a very, it was like, not really thinking about it, but then it became a weird kind of sexually toned moment, and I was like, huh, well, it's kind of unavoidable sometimes, but that being said, you need to slow your roll, mama. Indeed. And, yeah. What's so weird? <laughs> I, I, mama sounds lonely. And I'm not saying that as like an insult. It's just like I can almost relate to it. Like, this, this one woman is the only woman I've talked to in months. Got me a drink. Does she love me? <laughs> but he's married. <laughs> but, That's but, the... <laughs> but, but it's a monster drink. Maybe he's trying to communicate something. He yeah. got me. Finger berry blast. <laughs> Which does sound like a monster energy drink title. The brown star fruit. <laughs> uh, man, I just I can't drink that stuff, man. Ooh, I haven't had any kind of energy drink in a long time, and like I I can't. Like I'm not trying to say it. it's just like yeah. Grape tugs Ooh, and hurt. ginger licks. Ooh. <laughs> That also reminds me of uh, me and my buddy. I'll, I'll leave him nameless. I don't know if he wants his name out there for this, but we like to go hard with like some really trashy shit sometimes. So we'll get like a bunch of 40s of malt liquor and things like that. So we, we got a six pack of... Uh, no, wait. Sorry, sorry. We got four Locos. Oh, God. And then a five-hour en five hour energy... And then one other thing that had like a number in the name, we were like going for 11 hours of what the fuck, like, <laughs> so <laughs> we were just drinking four locos and five hour energies and then two something and, oh my God, it was a fun night though. But of course, especially if you're coasting out of your 20s, you cannot do that every day. 
that'll wreck you for a day or two after if you're not careful. Oh well, yeah, dude. Those, uh, but those fun. things are evil. You ever played Edward Forty Hands? <laughs> no, I never have. I've I've heard of it. Yeah, I played that with that same friend. And that's where you have the 40s taped to your hands, and you have to finish them both before you get them removed. I had to pee really bad while drinking both. I managed to get into the bathroom and, like, use the doorknob to, like, get my uh, pajama bottoms down. <laughs> like, oh. you know, not like with cocaine or promises of acting work. <laughs> <laughs> That's another Dave, Dave Attell joke. Nice. But, uh, no, yeah, I managed to get them down, get over there, kind of elephant trunk it into the, into the bowl. And then I sat on the ground and kind of shimmied my way back on back into the pajama bottoms. It was hard, but I managed. Damn. Anyway. Well, like, I've always heard that you could, like, once you get one done, you can remove it. Not the case? Or you just didn't want to play that way? That's not the way we played it, man. We played street rules. Uh, (laughs) You had to finish both of them, man. Well, goddamn. Yeah. What is this, like, amateur hours? (laughs) Remove the one? Why don't we just just have tea time? (laughs) Well, then you can pee. <laughs> that's that's the whole point. <laughs> I just neither one of us could drink fast enough. And I play like, that game way too often, and just the hat, like I'll I'll just pee when I get home, and then immediately regret that decision. Yeah, man. Well, and I definitely have a tiny bladder. Like I gotta pee a lot, but I drink really fast, so I thought I could beat it. Like I'm just like, oh, I I down two drinks all the time, but. Apparently not at forty capacity. Yeah, so. that's a lot of that's a lot of liquor. Yeah, it was a good time though. So, uh, yeah. so Mama, maybe ask your boss if he wants to play Edward Forty Hands, or you know, have a four loco and some five hour energy and talk about yeah. marriage. Rip your and heart. What it means. <laughs> Get into a deep thinks about marriage, or yeah. think deeps. Think steeps. Think steeps. <laughs> Think steeps. Derps, derps. Uh, all right. Well, should we move on? Yeah, let's uh, hit the weird news and get out of here. We'll do the weird news. Pigs are highly intelligent creatures, and a study mm-hmm. released on Thursday has revealed that they're skilled gamers, too. The last woman I slept with was really smart, so it's definitely true. <laughs> oh, if you had to pick, you, had, you went there. <laughs> <laughs> I right. was going to make a, a self joke, but oh, okay. something kind of like that, you know. No, or like an it, not to be joke. fair, the last girl I hooked up with was a little more of a, a rodent. Like a rodent pig. You know, an R-O-U-S, a rodent of unusual sizes. Watch The Princess Bride. Yeah. And the part where Wesley's on the ground getting wrestled. (laughs) That was me. Over four years ago. How's that for honesty? (laughs) That's that's what I'm saying, though. Not to get super real or super honest, but... uh, yeah, over four years, and that's why. If that was the last time you did it, I'm like, I can't do this again until it's awesome. Yeah. Like, what What am I doing? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's me. And then being antisocial really doesn't help you solve that issue anytime soon. So there you have it. Indeed. Well, anyways. Anyway, this pig... So this these pigs, smart pig, they're gaming. So uh-huh. this, they've been researching this since the '90s. Apparently, Stanley 
Stanley Curtis, a legendary swine researcher. <laughs> he died in 2010. He was working on it back then. Legendary swine researcher. Yeah. That's a cannibal corpse song. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so there was, there's four pigs that helped out. Hamlet and Omelet. And two Pane Pinto micro pigs, Ebony and Ivory. Aww. And so... Yeah, they used a video game that they actually originally used on chimps and rhesus monkeys. So they mm. learned how to manipulate a joystick with their snouts to move a cursor. And once they got it to hit the far wall, it dropped a treat. And so they got... Yeah. They couldn't They're just really do good the same it. study with uh, World of Warcraft players? <laughs> manipulating the joystick with their snouts and such yeah in between slurps of from the trough <laughs> Mom, best friend. I, i'm kidding hey <laughs> just because i haven't been laid in over four years doesn't mean i can't make fun of you yeah <laughs> all right go ahead uh, well the, apparently the higher levels even the one ivory the little piggy was like getting it 76 percent of the time so, mm. yeah, they 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 were forced to retire, much like World of Warcraft players, <laughs> after twelve weeks of training because they had grown too large to stand long enough <laughs> to complete sessions. So, yeah, it happens in the gaming world. Man, he was like the goat. Yeah. Or wait, wait, the pig. Like the pig, <laughs> the player <laughs> in a game. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. In a, in a. Uh, yeah, I wonder if there's like one all star pig that won't give it up. He's like trying to go for that that one last championship. <laughs> I'm gonna go down to Tampa Bay and just do it one more time. Fuck everybody. Like, I'm gonna it. make these legs waddle one last time. I am so fucking sick of Pig Brady. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Uh, he's really throwing the pig skin around now. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> It's flabby as shit. Um, that does remind me. I think I saw like a little headline not too long ago where Elon Musk wants to put his uh, brain chip into chimpanzees or monkeys, and like where they can play video games in their brains. Oh yeah, something like that. So yeah, there's a lot of freaky deaky research that's uh, expanding. Yeah. If you uh, think about Boston Dynamics with their, uh, what was their little dog robot that they'd kick and it wouldn't fall over? Yeah, the little, the dancing one, yeah. Yeah, and that was about 2007 or 8 when they first showed that, and it was just this clumsy fucking thing, and then recently they just released that dancing video. Yeah, dude. And it's, it's just like, holy shit, like about 10 years, and there's that much progress, so... You wanna you wanna climb into a little bed and just just be in a virtual reality and just be <laughs> fed through a tube and just lie there all day because it's better than normal reality. I think I'd yeah. rather just become a cyborg and put some robot in me. And yeah, I just I'd be out and about, and yeah, I'd be less human, but somebody would was... be able to keep up with the modern world. Somebody was selling some of those like trampoline stilts. They have have like a little spring, but they mm -hmm. they're like raise you up like two feet. It's like, well, that's almost like being part robot. I want those. But if I yeah. put two feet on, people would be terrified of me, and I'd probably die. What I really want is uh, photosynthesism. Oh, I want to be go. able to like consume sunlight, and it's almost like your breakfast. That would be so funny. It's like walk out in your backyard and you're like, nom, 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 nom. Mm. Oh, God. <laughs> so good. But, uh, yeah, what freaks you out more? A video game playing pigs or the dancing dog robots? Um, well, I mean, the the robots don't scare me yet. 
Yeah, I, I know robots really scare people because of a lot of movies and stuff, but I just, I'm not... Even that fancy one... I'm not that too can, worried about him yet. Yeah, the one that can dance, like, yeah, we our batteries still suck. We're good. We're okay. And <laughs> you can also just do an EMP and probably, you know, you could, they're easily destroyable still. <laughs> so Yeah, I'm still more afraid of nuclear warheads. Yeah. So there is the uh what is it? Uh what do they call it in Terminator? Skynet. When Skynet uh, you know, becomes like a super intelligence in the computer system and then takes over the nuclear codes and just launches them. Yeah. Like that's that's creepy. Well, they don't have the nuclear computers connected to the internet. Smart, smart. That is so, a smart thing. And they're not, they're actually in the process of updating them f- from like wind, like DOS, like the first 1950s computers. Or yeah, so. I think some of them still run on like vacuum tube computers. So, but I yeah. feel like there's going to be that one guy in there is just trying to get his ideas. Like, you can make your coffee and check your email before pressing the codes. And god damn it, put the <laughs> internet in there. Uh. But, uh, you know, I guess we'll. We'll see when we get there. Is it going to be the video game pigs? The dancing dog robots? Or the internet? I don't know. Pigs are scary, though, too. Just on, just in, you know, like, just running around in the wild. They really are. There was a... We tried to hunt Havelina down in Arizona. Which is like a wild pig. And, uh... Never... We would hear them, but we never saw one. Yeah, those things are like, like discharge it, won't they? Or is that? Mm, I don't know if like ones. if you're in a group or anything, but if it, if you're by yourself, they are pretty aggressive. So I don't know how crazy. much, but yeah, they're crazy stuff. But we didn't eat meat for six weeks. We were there. We were we were thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so we were like negotiating with the counselors like if we catch one and we kill it we get to cook it and eat it right like well like yeah but <laughs> like <laughs> they totally didn't want us to do it though yeah uh. but then yeah I found an unopened Dr. Pepper once and an unopened you know like giant case of salsa some campers just left behind or some shit. Oh, damn. Oh, man. When I got that Dr. Pepper, I remember it's like, ah, there, I was like kind of slowly like hanging behind so I didn't have to share it. Oh, nice. And they're just like, they're like, what are you doing? It's like, I'll oh, just take it a pee. And just, I sat back walking down the creek, just sipping a cold Dr. Pepper because it had been sitting in the water. Oh yeah. God damn. Oh. Man, nothing's ever tasted so good. Oh yeah. That stuff could be amazing. Like I I used to usually when I I've never found one on a hike, but after a long hike we usually stop at the first gas station and get a get something like that. That's always just the best. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean Dr. Pepper's owned by Coca Cola, right? I think it's its own thing. I think Dr. Pepper is the third company. I think it's Pepsi, Coke, and Dr. Pepper 7-Up is like its own separate thing. I might argue that, but that's for another thing. Either way, whoever owns Dr. Pepper, if you want to sponsor the Jacob Wayne Show, write us at pakoshka at gmail.com. Indeed. It would be amazing. All right. Well, I'll catch you next week, Kellen. Sounds good. Have a good one, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Jacob Wayne Show. If you would like to contact us, please write us at fakoshka at gmail.com. That is F-A-K-O-S-H-K-A at gmail.com. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. Simply search The Jacob Wayne Show and it should pop right up. Make sure you like and subscribe and leave a review and share this podcast with your friends. Please write us. It helps add content to the show and makes the show even better for you, the listener. Thanks for tuning in.